Good afternoon, you Mavericks. It comes as no surprise you only die once. And guess what? We have an author who wrote the book on it. And he swims with sharks. So we're going to dive deep into the power of attorney and how to keep the court out of your financial business. I'm Francis Legassi, your Chief Curiosity Maverick, and I'm here with Catherine Wells, our Chief Inspiration Maverick, and we are your Mavericks of Senior Living. Welcome back, everybody. We are here with Jeff Althaus of Althaus Estate Planning. And he's going to talk to us today about all things estate planning. There is a lot to know here. And Jeff comes packed with information. And he's a little bit funny, too. As you can tell by the title of his book, You Only Die Once, that Francis mentioned. And you can't see this right here, but it says on the tombstone, Wish I Had a Plan. We don't want to end up like this. So, Jeff, welcome to the show today. We're yeah. happy to have you. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, Francis. Yes. Uh, pleasure to be here. As Kathy said, my name's Jeff Althaus with Althaus Law. I'm an estate planning and probate attorney. And uh, when I say that to people, most people have absolutely no idea what that means. Uh, <laughs> Do you I, know what it means? <laughs> sometimes. Okay. Uh, I get to tell people that I'm an attorney that doesn't sue anybody, which I kind of like. Uh, that is, that's actually really That's cool. the best kind of attorney. <laughs> yeah. I would agree. Yeah. Uh, so estate planning is really just planning for the inevitable. We're all going to pass away. Estate planning puts a plan in place that makes sure you get what you've worked hard for to the people you actually want it to go to instead of maybe the state coming in and taking everything or it going to people you wouldn't want to have it. And then probate is kind of the flip side of that where after someone passes away, if they have a plan that was set up not to avoid that process, a judge comes in and we work on transferring title of someone's assets. Uh, so that kind of sums up the probate process, too. Huh. Wow. That, so there's a lot there. And I just went through this with my family. Um, and I have a ton of questions. And I think you're probably going to answer many of them. And I know our audience will have a lot of questions as well. By the way, if you have questions, please put them in Facebook. And we will try to answer them on air. If we can't answer them on air, we'll get an answer to you. Absolutely. And, and so, Jeff, I'm kind of really curious, what do I even start to make a plan? Uh, it, it seems after hearing you talk, a little overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's not uncommon. Most people feel that way. Uh, the best thing I can say is start with a conversation. Uh, most estate planning attorneys will do a free initial consultation, and that's an excellent place to start. Mm -hmm. But even before that, talking with your family, figuring out what you'd want to have happen with your things. Uh, when it comes to estate planning, there's really two main routes that you can take. Uh, you can either start with a will-based plan, or you can start with a trust-based plan. And a big misconception is um, in the estate planning world is if you have a will, you have a plan in place, that you get to avoid that probate process that we talked about. And that's not true. Oh. So you, a will is really just a stack of papers that says where you want your stuff to go, but it's the instruction sheet for the probate process. Huh. So it makes probate easier, it makes it quicker, but it does not stop it. So probate happens no matter what. Not always. Okay. Uh, probate okay. is optional, and that's true in every single state. Huh. Uh, Colorado, we're fortunate. I always joke around and say it's a great place to die. It's also <laughs> a great place to live. <laughs> it's a, it's uh, a fabulous place to live. <laughs> uh, we have one of the easier probates of all the states. Okay. So in Colorado, probate is a six-month-long process. Now, it may seem long, but in other states, it can take years. Wow. Uh, in Colorado, you don't have to have a lawyer. Uh, yeah. We charge hourly rates. Some attorneys charge flat rates. In other states, some people will charge based on a percent of your estate. Seriously? Uh, we don't do that here, which I find nice. I think that's kind of unethical. Sorry, other states. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you don't even need an attorney in Colorado. So you can get through the probate process by yourself. But like I said, it's completely optional. So with a trust, which is kind of the flip side of a will, that's the main way most people avoid probate. Um, okay. When should I even begin to consider? I mean, is there a certain age I should consider sitting down with a, you know an estate planning? Should I have be married, kids? Can I do it single? When should I start that process? Sure. Well, I'm biased, so I say that everyone can benefit from an estate plan. But uh, there are some red flag events that happen in your life that can really trigger the need for an estate plan. I would say the main one, and a lot of people 
realize this but then never get around to it is right when you have children. Okay. Uh, when you're starting a family, that's yeah. a big one. Okay. Yeah. And people usually realize that and then put it off and then when they're 70 come back and tell me, hey, I should have done this a long time ago. Uh, or <laughs> you, may, you may find this to be true, you put a will in place and then other life events happen and you never go back and revisit, yeah, such absolutely. as divorce and remarriage. And and all of those are also times when you should get an estate plan if you yeah. don't already have one. Okay. Okay. So it's really important with minor children though because minor children cannot inherit and if mom and dad can't be mom and dad anymore for whatever reason, whether that's death, incapacity, or some other reason, in your estate plan you can say who becomes the new mom and dad. Uh, if you don't say that, a judge who's never met you or your kids has to come in and just pick someone they think is best to parent your children. Uh, that could be foster care. That could be Uncle Johnny that you wouldn't want within 100 yards of your kids. Uh, that could really be anybody. Wow. So you really want to take control and make sure that you know who's going to be parenting your children if something should happen to you. Absolutely. So in terms of avoiding probate, how do you do that through a trust? Sure. So let me start with what a trust actually is yeah, first. Good point. Uh, <laughs> just like a will, it's a stack of papers that says where you want your stuff to go. However, when you create a trust, you create an entity. And it's recognized by the state. It can have its own tax ID number. But most trusts are what we call revocable living trusts. And not to get too deep into the taxes, I love tax law and I will not you will do not love you. tax law? Oh my I do. goodness. Oh, my. Uh, That's why he swims with sharks. Oh, so he, he has some excitement somewhere Jesus. in his life. Uh, <laughs> it's true. Uh, helping people avoid taxes is great um, but I will not bore you to death with those today. When you only die once we won't kill you off today. Uh, but with a trust you create this entity and since it's an entity recognized by the state it can actually own property. So what we do, it's kind of weird, uh, okay. if, if you own a house. So Francis, we would transfer your house into the trust. Now it's kind of weird to think about, but you no longer own anything because we have transferred everything into your trust. So in Colorado, huh. there's two key points to remember on how you get into probate. The first one is you own real property and that's split up into land, mineral interests, or house. Okay. So if you own any of those, we're in probate. The second requirement, this just went up this year, it was $68,000 last year, this year it's $70,000. If you have more than $70,000, the judge kicks you into probate to get those assets. Is that including retirement, life, whatever it may be? Is it IRA? Sometimes. Oh, okay. uh, so those are all, everything you guys just brought up are beneficiary designated assets. Jesus, this life is complicated. <laughs> That's why my job exists. Yeah. Uh, so. If you have anything with a beneficiary designation on it, and a lot of people don't know that bank accounts count for this, because if you go to your bank and ask for what's called a POD, or a payable on death designation, that turns your bank account into a beneficiary designated asset. You get to say who gets it when you pass away. Huh. Same with life insurance, same with IRAs, 401ks, retirement plans, investments, all that good stuff. They then don't count toward that 70,000. If you don't have anyone named, counts toward your 70000 So, okay. so it, okay. if you had 100000 in your bank account and you didn't designate it, and you had all the other assets were, let's say, in trust, mm -hmm. that 100000 could trigger you to go into probate. 100%. And that's why trusts don't always avoid probate. I tell people, I'm going to set up a plan for you. It's going to work perfect today, but you can screw it up in the future. <laughs> <laughs> if you change your beneficiary designations, if you buy new property and don't get it into the trust, that property is going to go through the probate process even though everything else avoids it. And once you're in probate, you're kind of in probate. And, what about like, and you're in probate for six months. At, at what least. about business ownership? Like if you own a, an LLC personally, does that, can that trigger going into probate? Uh, or is it, that a whole other kettle of fish? It depends on how you set up the business. So having a business is great. Uh, normally LLCs, S-Corps, C-Corps all avoid probate. Sole proprietors do not. Interesting. Okay. So the key point to those two requirements to get into probate are if you own something in your name alone. So if an LLC owns a building that you work mm -hmm. in, that doesn't have to go through probate because it goes per the business documents. Okay. So operating agreements are key. Bylaws are key. Um, that's kind of like the trust or the will for the business. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, but going back to those two requirements with a trust, when your trust owns absolutely everything, 
the judge looks at you and says, Francis, do you have a house? Nope. Kathy, do you have over $70,000? Nope. Your trust has all that stuff. Your trust keeps living after you pass away, and you've named what's called a successor trustee to kick in. You're the original trustee. I didn't mention that earlier. Uh, but your successor trustee is around after you pass away, hopefully. You've named enough backups to where that's the case. <laughs> um, and uh, they just do whatever your trust says to do. Huh. And they can do it without judge approval, court approval, that's and don't need any so court orders. Faster, then. It usually is. Huh. Okay, wow. that's interesting. That um, is really interesting. There's so much around that, and as I mentioned, I just went through this, and, and my family just went through it, and you gave an amazing recap of that, and there, there's so many details around it. If you have questions, definitely uh, reach out to Jeff, because you do free consultations, right? Absolutely. Um, but let, yeah, and we'll put all, all that, that in the show, show notes, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. So, so let's move to the next topic, which is power of attorney. And I, I know that there are some nuances with power of attorney. So can you explain what they are, when they're used, and how they're used? Sure. So this might seem weird to hear from an attorney who makes money off drafting wills and trusts, but uh, to me, those are the least important documents I do for people. Really? Powers of attorney are probably the most important. Oh. And a few reasons we'll get into, but let's talk about what the heck they are in the first place. Uh, there's two of them, so a lot of people in the past used to just have one, and it was just called a general power of attorney, and that included medical and financial powers inside of it. Okay. Now we split it up, and there's a medical power of attorney and a financial power of attorney. Okay. And what you're really doing in here, just the basics of a power of attorney, is you're naming an agent, which can just be anybody you know, to act for you if you can't act for yourself. So if you're incapacitated, you're in a coma, vegetative state, anything where a doctor says that you can't make your own decisions anymore, uh, then who makes those decisions for you? If you don't decide, this is not a fun fact for people, but these are not optional documents in Colorado. They're mandatory. So a judge will come in and decide for you. And just like we mentioned earlier. So they'll pick the guardian, or not the guardian, the power, power of attorney. Mm -hmm. uh, but you said a key word there. When a judge appoints your medical or financial power of attorney, that's called a guardian and conservator. And oh. Just to confuse things even more, <laughs> different states call them different things. Oh, lovely. Uh, lovely. And, okay. and not only different things, sometimes they just flip them. So in some states, a conservator oh, deals with your medical stuff and a guardian deals with financial. But here in Colorado, a guardian deals with your medical stuff when it's court appointed, and a conservator deals with your financial stuff when it's court appointed. And to get these people appointed, you're in what's called a guardianship and conservatorship hearing. Shocking name. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but Yeah, very creative <laughs> in the courts. Uh, that hearing alone is usually about five to $10,000 per person that we're working with. So a married couple can escalate the prices a lot. And that's court fees, attorney's fees. Wow. And then if people are contesting who should be guardian and conservator, because it can be anybody, uh, sometimes it's even a professional if the judge doesn't like any of his or her options. Wow. Um, but then you're paying that professional an hourly rate. If it's an attorney, uh, three, four hundred dollars or more. And for the rest of your incapacity, which could be the rest of your life. So I want to oh. ask a question that I'm, I'm guessing our audience is thinking right now. Many of our audience members are people who are looking out for their older adult. Sure. And maybe their older adult in their life, mom or dad or, or anyone, um, doesn't have a power of attorney yet and isn't interested in talking about it. Um, what Jeff just shared, as I understand it, that's the reason that you really need to find a way to have that conversation with them because it will end up out of your hands, but mostly out of their hands, mm. and that's not what they want. Right. And then mm. the costs can get excessively high, it sounds like. Absolutely. prohibitively high for many of us. And a great way to start that conversation is leading with some of those misconceptions. Even married couples think that under the law, just because they're married, they're automatically each other's financial and medical power of attorney. And that's not true. Hmm. And you're not okay. automatically in line to be a financial or medical power of attorney just because you're related to someone. Wow. So if mom or dad don't want to talk about it, uh, you can just bring up, you know, wouldn't you rather have one of us or someone you control uh, you control who's in charge rather than a judge coming in who's never met you and just kind of guessing. Or maybe play that snippet of this Facebook Live for them that he just <laughs> went through yeah. prior, um, if that's helpful to you. 
Yeah, and I'm sure you address that in the book as well, some ways yeah. to talk with family members. Definitely. So power of attorney, there's the medical and there's the health care. Uh, power, or, sorry, the financial and the medical power right. of attorney. Um, tell us a little bit of the differences briefly. Sure. Yeah. So the medical power of attorney is where you're just designating that person to make your medical decisions for you. It's pretty straightforward. Who's talking to the doctors? Who's okaying surgeries? Um, Long-term care, hospice, all those kind of decisions. The key thing they do not decide, if you have a full plan, is what's in your living will. Uh, mm -hmm. And I can briefly talk about that. The living will is where you decide if two doctors come in and say, I'll pick on myself for this one. Uh, Jeff has no more brain capacity. I don't know I'm alive anymore. I never will again. I'm basically in that persistent vegetative state. But life support is keeping me alive. How long do I want to stay on life support? And that's the living will. Living will. Okay. Worst name document on the planet. It's not a will at all. It doesn't have much to do with being alive. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> but you can take that really critical and stressful decision out of your power of attorney's hands by having that document. And then that's the one medical decision your medical power of attorney can't make. Oh, okay. But okay. flip side of that coin, financial power of attorney, uh, really kind of the same thing. They're just making the financial decisions for you. So accessing your bank accounts, paying bills, making sure that if or when you get better, everything is how you left it and cool. you still have all your stuff. So you can have huh. one child, if you use sort of a traditional family structure, you could have one child as the medical power of attorney and one as health care if you wanted. Absolutely. Or you could have two children as both, mm -hmm. and they have to work in concert with each other. So there's lots of different configurations, right? I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, first and foremost, I always recommend backups. So try to think of at least three people. Have a primary agent, which can be your spouse, uh, mm. or it can be a child. Uh, and then have a backup, and a backup to the backup. And that's because one of my goals for everyone is keep you out of court. And if someone passes away, and then we don't have a backup in place, a judge has to come in and decide who gotcha. your backup okay. is, so you're back in court. The second thing I want to touch on is a very important misconception that, that you just brought up, and that's you can name both of your kids together. Yes, you can. I never recommend it. Oh, Not once in my career. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's why it's great when you have multiple options. You can rotate the kids so people don't feel left out. Uh, but the reason why you don't ever want two people in charge at the same time is because, while I'm sure your kids have never disagreed on anything, if they disagree <laughs> on this, we're in court and the judge is the third party tiebreaker. Oh, jeez. And okay. I also don't recommend three people because that's impossible to, for anyone to make a decision. Yeah. yeah. That's a lot. Yeah, that's so, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, what, one other quick thing on POAs before we move to our next topic. Sure. For power of attorney, one thing I learned is that uh, Social Security does not recognize power of attorney. It's a different process that you have to go through to gain control of Social Security Yes. Uh, for your parents so, or whoever you're looking out for. So the power of attorney can help in that a lot. Uh, Social Security wants you to designate what's called your rep payee or your representative payee. Uh, and that's kind of the equivalent of a power of attorney, but specific to Social Security. And then another key point, um, you just keep bringing up great points. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> when someone passes away and you're trying to stop Social Security or something like that, uh, your power of attorney document is worthless. So they are very important while huh. someone's alive. They stop that guardianship conservatorship hearing, let you name who's in charge. Once someone passes away, their powers of attorney are worthless. We throw them out and shred them. Now your personal representative in your will or your trustee in your trust take over. Cool. Okay. So, so that's a lot. Right. That's a lot. <laughs> so let's kind of go to some, hopefully a little softer subject. How can we leave money or, or assets or things to kids, grandkids? What, what can we do to make that as smooth as possible? Because you mentioned earlier, minors can't inherit, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, Correct. so how can we, get, is there a way to get around that? Yeah, absolutely. There's a way around everything. Uh, so kind of the light at the end of the tunnel is there is hope, there is good news. Uh, if you have a trust in place, which is what I recommend for minor children, you can say how and when people inherit. So morbidly call it parenting from the grave. Uh, but <laughs> you, can, uh, you can put strings on when, where, and how anyone you want inherits. It doesn't even have to be minor children or grandchildren, but that's just the most common okay. time that it comes up. So if someone who is under the age of 18 inherits, and let's just say we're working with a million dollars in one kid just to make it easy. Uh, 
it's a 12 year old, they inherit a million dollars, and there's no plan in place. Under the law, we treat minor children just like incapacitated adults. So we are in that guardianship and conservatorship hearing again, five to ten thousand dollars later, and now we have maybe a professional, maybe that child's parent, we don't know, appointed to manage that money and uh, care for that child's needs, and you're paying that professional again, three hundred bucks an hour, maybe more, uh, and until they're 18. Um, and weird thing under the law, if you inherit at 18, you get everything out, outright. So in our example, a million dollars. Who wants to see an 18-year-old with a million dollars? <laughs> not, a, not a good idea. Uh, the 18-year-old does. Yeah. yeah, right. So that money's gone in a year. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if you have a conservatorship, so if you inherit at 12, it's locked in that conservatorship until you're 21. So 17-year-olds kind of get the shaft. 18-year-olds get everything outright. Wow. Uh, so a weird little hole in the law, in my so opinion. So how do you avoid that? Right. Uh, with a trust, you can say, instead of it going to this 12-year-old, we're going to go to our trust, which is already an existing entity. It already actually owns that property anyway. Okay. And you name a specific trustee to be in charge for that 12-year-old, which could be mom or dad, or it could be brother, sister, it could be anyone, as long as they're old enough. And then you get to say in that trust, whatever you want. My general recommendation for people is, we have three ages that we distribute property. We hold everything until they're 25, and then we give them a third. Then at 30, we give them another third. And then at 35, if they haven't learned from their mistakes, they're probably not going to, uh, so we give it all to them. <laughs> but <laughs> that's just a starting point. Okay. You can change those ages, percentages. You can add whatever you want. And we do one more key thing. We give your trustee the power uh, of discretion, and we call it a HEMS standard, or MESH, if you want to mix the letters around. But that stands for health education, maintenance, and support. Okay. So they can always contribute for those needs, no matter how old the child is. Okay, interesting. That is fantastic. There is so much information here. I'm really inspired by the way you are able to summarize this information and share it so that it's accessible to our audience. Thank you. And also to add a little humor into it, because <laughs> this isn't a fun topic, and it it's, can be a little bit boring. So I'm super inspired by that. Um, Jeff, something that we're starting to do this year is ask our guests, who in your life is, has been a maverick? Sure. Uh, it's a little corny, but it's my wife, uh, Amanda. Those are the best. Yeah. <laughs> Brownie points, too, by the way. Yeah, she is the best. <laughs> um, she started with a small startup company, I think, about five years ago now. Don't kill me for not knowing that. Uh, <laughs> But when they started, there was less than 10 people. Oh, wow. uh, it's a, a website company, which they do not like to be called anymore. Uh, it's Revenue River. They're awesome. But uh, they now have grown to over 50 people. Wow. And she runs her own department that she created from scratch That's awesome. inside that company. That's so cool. Um, it's called Sales Enablement is the department, but I won't bore you with what that is because I don't think I could explain it to you. I could, but we'll have side conversations <laughs> yeah. about that. That's awesome. That is so fantastic. Congratulations, yeah. Amanda. Yes. That's really, really wonderful. Yes. And my favorite Mavericks are when it's a family member, when it's a, get, a, a wife or a spouse or a child. Yeah. Um, so after all this conversation today, I know that people will have questions and will probably want to reach out to you, but what action would you want people to take after this conversation? 100% get a plan. Uh, it doesn't have to be from me, uh, any estate planning attorney, and if you're talking to attorneys and trying to put a plan together, I do not recommend doing it for yourself, I realize I'm biased, but <laughs> it doesn't work out very well. Uh, make sure it's an estate planning attorney. Whenever you need something, go to someone who specializes in it. Any attorney can do a will, an estate planning attorney will do it right. Okay. Um, so get a plan in place for those uh, younger adults that may be just starting a family and having a kid. Make sure you get that guardianship in place inside that plan so your kids are taken care of and we can avoid foster care. That's good. That's, that's fantastic. That's yeah. probably really Yeah, that's probably what we all elements. want. Yeah. So how do you think in doing this you're creating hope for the way we age? Uh, well, it's actually my favorite part of my job is I get to create peace of mind. Uh, I was talking to Francis earlier that in all other areas of law, there's a winner and a loser, and even the winner's not very happy. People are getting sued, and everyone's fighting and tearing each other's throats out. In estate planning and probate, I'm helping people see the light at the end of the tunnel, giving everyone peace of mind, and letting them know that everything they've worked hard for is going to get to where they want it to go. 
I can attest to that, having just recently gone through this. My father did all the estate planning and made it so easy on us. In fact, I'm sitting on the other side of it going, I can't believe how easy it was. I expected much more. So I can attest to, if you put the work into it, it will matter for the people that you leave behind. Um, so Jeff, how can people find you if they want to learn more? Sure, you can always give me a call, 720-340-2783. Check us out on our website, it's althouselaw.com. No one can spell my last name, so good luck with it. But <laughs> It'll be in the comments, though. It <laughs> will. Spell for you in the comments. With there links you go. and everything. And perfect. Uh, you can find us on Facebook and all kinds of social media, too. And I encourage you to check out this book. It is super accessible, very easy to read, um, super simple information in here really simplifies it, makes it easy to understand. And if you're a dog person on the back is a picture of Jeff with his dog named Moses. And we have our little uh, mascot here today who joined us. That's this right. is Maya. So we, we got the dog thing going today. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you have questions, please put them in the comments. And as always, we encourage you to join the Maverick movement. Shoot us an email. Tell us what you want to hear. We really want to build shows around what you want to learn or need to learn. So. Just reach out to us, like our page, follow us on the podcast, follow us on our Facebook Lives, because we really need to hear from you, our viewers. So have a great rest of your day. I'm Francis, your Chief Curiosity Maverick. I'm Catherine, your Chief Inspiration Maverick. We'll see you real soon.